Uh, welcome to Summer Tales. Uh, for the last few years, we've had to kind of uh, put our winter tales uh, to bed uh, because of COVID, so we're happy that you were able to join us this evening uh, for a few stories um, that we'd love to share with good adult audiences. Uh, Joan Didion said, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. Now, she had more to say about that particular thing. But to me, it means that our lives are stories. When we are observing things, we make them into stories. It's almost innate. And so we welcome you this evening to listen to our stories, to make them your own. We hope that they touch you. We hope that you turn your cell phones off. <laughs> and so we will get started here. And uh, thank you all for being here. There are some familiar faces even behind the masks uh, this evening, and we're so glad to have you here. The Bloomington Storytellers Guild, the Monroe County Public Library, together supporting stories. Thank you. Oh, I'm Patty Callison, by the way. <laughs> Patty Callison, another hand for Patty. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. And uh, my name is Lisa Champelli. And this story has some loud parts, so I might step back, but I, I will try to make sure that everyone can still hear me. Is this a comfortable volume right now? Yes. All right. So I'm going to start us off with a classic tale. Hmm, someone has, <laughs> someone's device talking to them. <laughs> the Brothers Grimm did not have to worry about this aspect. <laughs> so this is a story that goes back uh, long ago, a classic tale from the Brothers Grimm uh, about a quick-witted woman who is known as Clever Gretel. Now, once upon a time, there was a cook who was called Clever Gretel. Gretel, and she enjoyed eating as much as she enjoyed cooking. And one morning, her employer, whose name was John Smith, told her that he had invited a special guest over for dinner and asked if she could please prepare two fine hens in the best way that she knew how. Of course, sir, she said. And she went promptly to the market and selected two of the finest, plumpest hens that she could find. She brought them back home, butchered them, plucked them, and then marinated them in a savory wine sauce. Of course, after sampling the wine first to make sure that it had not soured in the summer heat. And after confirming her wine selection several times over, she uh, was ready to transfer the chickens uh, and begin roasting them over the open fire. The chickens, after some time, uh, began to turn a beautiful golden brown. And she was watching them carefully, slowly roasting over the fire. And she noticed that they were just about ready, just at their prime, just about ready to be eaten. But there was no guest. And so she called out to her employer, sir, the chickens, they are at their perfection. Where is the guest though? And John had to reply, Gretel, I'm sorry, he's not here yet, I don't know. Oh, but these chickens, they need to be eaten right now at their juicy finest. What shall we do? And John said, I will go and fetch him. Per perhaps he forgot the way here. Just, just uh, try to keep it going, Gretel, I know you can do it. And he went off in search of his guest. And Gretel, she took the chickens from the fire to let them rest a bit. And she felt that this effort warranted a sip of wine. And then she took the chickens and put them back over the fire. And again, 
felt that this effort required some more quenching of her thirst as she continued to turn the spit ever so slowly to keep the chickens warm and drizzled melted butter over the tops to keep them moist. And her mouth began to water as she watched the butter drip slowly down the sides of the chickens. Oh my goodness, they looked so good. The aroma of the herbs filled the kitchen. She couldn't wait to eat them. But did they taste as good as they looked and smelled? Of course, there's only one way to find that out. But there was no guest yet. The chickens, though, they were ready. She ran to the window to look out and see. Perhaps they were on their way. But alas, no. When she went back to the chickens, she noticed that one of the wings was burned. Oh, no, this wing is singed. Well, we can't have that. I can't serve a burnt piece of chicken to the special guest. I'll, I'll just have to eat that one. And so she plucked it off, popped it in her mouth, and mmm, mmm. <laughs> it was as delicious as it looked and smelled. And she looked back, gazing on the chickens fondly, and noticed that the first chicken looked a little odd now with just one wing sticking up. And really, she should probably eat the second wing just to kind of balance things out, right? So she plucked the second wing and popped it in her mouth. And oh, this one was just as good as the first wing. And she wiped the chicken uh, grease from her chin and ran over to the window to see if perhaps the guest was finally on his way because these chickens were perfection. But still, no one was arriving. And when she went back to look at the chickens, she began to wonder, well, perhaps they decided just to eat dinner in town. Maybe they're not even coming back to the house. And what a shame it would be if no one enjoyed these chickens. Why, I have worked so hard all day. Someone should enjoy these chickens. It might as well be me. I've already eaten the first uh, wings off of the first bird. And so Gretel decided to eat all of the first chicken, every last bite. And it was indeed delicious, savory, juicy. And she ran to the window hoping that someone else would be able to enjoy the meal that she had prepared, but there was still no one coming to the house. Oh, she began to feel sad, and so she took another sip of wine and then declared, I might as well enjoy the rest of my hard-cooked meal myself. And so she consumed the entire second chicken. She felt she was doing her due diligence to confirm that it was indeed as delicious as the first, and it was. It was fabulous, every last bite. And as she took her apron and was wiping her mouth, she heard John entering in the front door. And he called out to her, Gretel, Gretel, come on, bring the chickens out. My guest is arriving. But of course, Gretel had no chickens to bring out. Now John could see that the table was set and everything appeared ready to go, and so he picked up his carving knife because he really enjoyed carving the chickens with a very sharp knife, and he began to sharpen that knife. And Gretel could hear him from the kitchen. He was in the other room sharpening away. And she began to imagine that blade slicing through her own neck. And then she noticed. Through the window, she could see the guest had mistakenly followed the path around to the side of the house, to the uh, kitchen entryway. And he knocked ever so politely on the door. And Gretel ran over to the door, opened it slightly, and she said, shh, hush. Don't say a word. I know the gentleman has invited you here for a very special dinner, but he is a crazed man, and he intends to cut off both of your ears. Now you can hear him in the other room sharpening the knives. Listen. And sure enough, they could hear. The guest was horrified, and he immediately turned around and ran down the path as fast as he could. And then Gretel 
whose thinking had not been impaired by her wine consumption, went over into the other room, shouted to John, what kind of a guest did you invite here? And he said, well, what do you mean, Brittle? And she, he, she said, well, he knocked on the kitchen entry door and then snatched both of the chickens off the platter just as I was bringing them out to you. You can see him running down the pathway now with both the chickens. Oh, no. John was horrified. Both of the chickens? He took both of them? You mean he didn't even leave one for me to eat for my dinner? Oh, well, how far has he gotten? Perhaps I can catch him. And so, with knife in hand, he went running out the front door, shouting, Stop! Stop! It's just one! Just leave me one! I only want one! Please, stop! But the guest, he kept running as fast as he could go because he preferred to keep both of his ears. And as for Gretel, she managed to keep her job and go on to cook and eat and drink and be merry and clever for another day. Hello. <clears throat> My name is David Matlack, and I'm a storyteller, and an educator, and a veterinarian. So I thought I would tell you a dog story. Got to tell you about my dog, Blue. He's the best hunting dog in the county. Now, to understand what happened to Blue, first I got to tell you about Miss Wilson. Now see, we lived in a little cabin on top of the hill. At the bottom of the hill was a pond, and there on the far edge of the pond was the Wilson place. All right, well, one morning, she was out in her porch, a churning butter, when she spied down at that pond a big eight-point buck, a big deer. Now she was known throughout the land as the best shot in the county, and she was not slow to seize this opportunity. She crept back into her cabin, to the fireplace, reached up above the mantel, grabbed the musket. She took some buckshot and gunpowder, tamped it down in there, took some kitchen knives, tamped them down in there, and a piece of rope. Went back out on that porch and went to raise aim to fire when suddenly my mama decided she needed some lard for the morning biscuits and she was gonna call Miss Wilson. Now, I'm sure you understand we didn't have no telephone, certainly didn't have no cell phone. I mean, she went out on the porch, oh, Miss Wilson! Well, spook that buck right out of his hooves. But that Miss Wilson, she was a good shot and a smart lady. She knowed exactly what that deer was gonna do. He was gonna run along the pond and curve through the woods to the left. So she took that musket and she bent that musket, that barrel, over her knee in a fine swooping curve to the left, went to raise, aim, and bang! Well, sure enough, that buckshot throwed that deer up in the air, pierced his heart, killed him instantly. Them knives skinned and field dressed him. And that rope caught him by the hawk and left him hanging from the oak tree by the pond. I told you she was a good shot, now didn't I? All right, well, now here's the part about blue. All right, now simultaneously, coincidentally, and at the same time, my dog Blue was sleeping under the porch, our porch, when his nose informed him of the presence of that buck down at the pond. Well, like a bolt of lightning, he shot out from under that porch, down the hill like a blue streak, found himself on the heels of that eight-point buck when something throwed up, up in the air, killed it instantly, skinned and field dressed it, and left it hanging from the tree. Well, he was a putting on the brakes, and oh, he didn't even see it coming. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't blame the Wilsons. It was the plowing season, and it was customary to leave the plow out of an evening, though I don't know I'd have left it right in the trail like that. 
Well, like I said, he was a putting on the brakes, but he had some momentum going, staring at his clary, hanging from the tree, and oh, he just slammed right into one of them plow blades. Cut that dog in two. Sir, this ain't comedy, this is tragedy. <laughs> well, I heard a yelp, and I come running down the hill, and there I seen my prize blue laying in two halves. Well, I had already determined to be a veterinary, and this was my first chance to practice. I scooped up them two halves, ran him up to the hill, went to the stand of pine trees. I knew we was bleeding them for pine tar, stickiest stuff around. Put my hand in that cart, the tar cup, got a big old handful, ran back to the porch, slathered all over them two halves, slapped him back together. Dumped him in a barrel of turpentine, Ma said it cured anything. <laughs> Took two of daddy's t-shirts, wrapped him up like a pharaoh's mummy. Now after about a week, I seen that tail wagon, and I knowed it was time to change the dressing. Well, I go to unwrapping him, and oh my. <laughs> now you gotta understand, I had not yet been to veterinary school, didn't have no book learning, just a desire to help the Lord's creatures. Well, well, his left side was fine, but it seems I put that right side on upside down. <laughs> now he had two legs down and two legs up. <laughs> but you know what? Well, he was a better dog, hunting dog after that. He could not only bark at both ends, but he'd get tired on these two legs. He'd just flip over and run on those two. <laughs> Best hunting dog in the county, my dog Blue. My name is Dana, and I'm going to tell you the story of the Porcelain Man. Once a long time ago, there was an old ramshackle house that stood at the edge of town, and in that house lived a man and his daughter. Now the man would go into town and collect junk. He'd load up his cart, and he'd bring it home, and he would give it to his daughter, and she would fix the junk. Now she didn't just fix it so it looked like it had been mended. She fixed it so it looked like it was brand new. It was an incredible gift. And the father knew it. And he'd been telling her her whole life, the world is full of thieves and robbers and ne'er-do-wells. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. You're so lucky to be safe right here. And she'd never known anything different, and so she believed him. Well, one day, just like most of the other days, he set out to go into town to go collect some junk, and he warned her again, don't go outside, leave all the blinds closed, lock the door behind me. The world is full of terrible people. You're so lucky to be here in this house. And so he shut the door, he left, and he went into town. And he collected a few things here, he collected a few things there. And on his way back home, he passed by a row of very, very beautiful houses. And in the front of these houses, there was a stoop, and on just about every stoop was a beautiful vase. Oh, he admired those vases. They were beautiful. Well, just as he was looking at one, one of the doors flew open, and a maid came out, and she was swinging a broom, and she was yelling at a cat, get out of here, get, get, get. And her broom brushed past one of those vases. Well, she didn't notice it. She turned around and went back in the house and slammed the door. But that vase started to wobble, and then sure enough, it fell over. It rolled down the stoop, it rolled down the sidewalk, and then smash right into a lamppost. Oh, thought the man. 
He waited. Nobody ever came out. So he ran over to that pile of porcelain and he swept it all up into a bag and he put it in his cart and he went home as fast as he could. And he opened up the door and he said to his daughter, stop what you're doing. You need to put together this vase. This vase is a masterpiece. It's beautiful. It's going to make us all kinds of money. Well, she did what she was told. She got out her blanket, and she laid all the porcelain out on that blanket. She got her glue, and she started to put this vase back together. And the father was not going to sit around and watch this. So he decided to go outside and go work on his wagon. Well, this young woman had been putting things together for her father for a very long time. And so her mind often wandered. And lately, her mind had been wandering a lot. And she started to question just how bad the world actually was. And as she was putting together this vase, she started to think about what it would be like to go out into the world maybe have an adventure, maybe do something exciting, maybe have a little bit of a romance. Well, before long, she was at the final piece, and she placed it in, and she stood back to look at her work. But she hadn't put together a vase. She'd put together a man, a porcelain man. She was astonished. She couldn't believe what she was looking at. And then the porcelain man moved, and he reached out his arms, and he said, I love you. She couldn't believe it. Well, at that very moment, her father opened up the door, and he couldn't believe what he was seeing. He picked up a chair, and he smashed it over that porcelain man's head, and pieces went flying everywhere. Well, this was a new feeling for this young woman. Then she looked at her father and she was angry. And she said, what have you done? Well, he said, I, I, I walked into the room and, and, and there, was a, there was a man putting his arms around you. I, I was defending you. He told me he loved me. What, he said? He told me he loved me. This porcelain man walked towards you with his arms out and he told you that he loved you? Yes, she said. Oh, said the father. We are going to be this is incredible! A walking, talking porcelain man? Do you know what we have now? Oh, I'm going to build a cage. We're going to put him in this cage. We're going to take him to the county fair. We're going to charge people a dollar to come and see him. We're going to be rich! And with that, he went outside to go build a cage. Hurry up and get that guy put together again, he said. He was so excited. She was not. She picked up her glue, and she picked up all those pieces of porcelain, and she put them back down on that blanket, and she started to think, I need to get out of here. I need an adventure. I need something else in my life. And she started to dream about all kinds of things. And when she placed that last piece of porcelain, she hadn't put together a vase, she hadn't put together a man, she put together a horse. And she went over to the door, she opened up that front door, she jumped on that horse, gave it a giddy up, and they went straight out that door. She never saw her father again. And they went on and on for miles and miles and miles until she was absolutely exhausted. And she said, whoa, we have to stop. I'm very, very tired. I got to rest under this tree for a while, and then I got to figure out what it is that I'm going to be doing. 
And so she got down off the horse and she sat down under the tree. And the horse said, I'm going to smash into this tree and you're going to put me back together again as the porcelain man. And before she could say anything, that horse ran smack into that tree and busted into a thousand pieces. She didn't have any glue. What was she going to do now? Oh, so she sat there and she thought, but she was determined. Uh, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up on my dreams. I hadn't come this far just to turn around and go back home. <sighs> well, just then, clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop, down the road, here came a young man with a cart and a horse. And he stopped right next to her and he said, Looks like you are in a little bit of trouble, maybe. Do you need some help? Yeah, she said, I do need some help. I have all of this porcelain, and I need to get it back together again, but I don't have any glue. Oh, he said, I got tons of glue at my house. Come on over to my house, and we'll put we'll put this beautiful porcelain back together again. So that's what they did. They scooped up all that porcelain, they put it in the back of his cart, and they went to his house. And when they got there, they took all of the porcelain out and they laid it out on a table. And he got two bottles of glue, one for him, one for her. And they started to piece that porcelain together. And they started to tell each other stories. And they started to tell each other jokes. And they laughed. And they had a really good time together. And when they were done placing all of that porcelain together, it wasn't a man, it wasn't a vase, it wasn't a horse. It was a beautiful set of dishes. <laughs> and the man said, well, now that we have all these dishes, would you like to stay for dinner? And she said, OK. And so they went into the kitchen, and they prepared dinner together. And sometimes their hands would touch, and sometimes they would tell each other funny stories. And finally, when the dinner was ready, they went out into the dining room, and they laid it out all on the table. And she got herself a little bit of salad, and she put it on the plate. And the plate whispered up to her, I love you. <laughs> and she said, as she looked down at that plate. Shh, I'm happy now. And that was the story of the porcelain man. <laughs> My name's Jenny Ritchie. What you need to know about me today is that I love vegetables. I love vegetables this time of year. I love the vegetables ripening in the garden. I love the fresh vegetables at the market. I love my plate full of tasty vegetables. But I know you're wondering, and I've wondered too, with all these vegetables, why have I never heard one speak? Well, wonder no more. This story will satisfy your curiosity. Imagine a green valley with a hedge down the middle. And on one side of the hedge is a broad field where there lives a colony of peaceful rabbits. On the other side of the hedge, there is a garden, and in the garden there lives a band of gallant carrots. <laughs> now every morning and every evening, the rabbits come out and they trim the grass. And the grass doesn't mind, because the grass is busy down underground being grass roots and talking about important things. And like some people who talk about important things, would never have thought of getting a haircut if it weren't for the rabbits. Over in the garden, 
the carrots lay abed until nightfall. And as the sun began to go down, they would get up. Uh, because carrots look their best in the light of the setting sun, these were very vain carrots. I mean, they were preening, they were posing, and all the other vegetables would come around and admire them. The, the fat turnip with a good heart, but no brains. The, the dull and earthy radishes and the uh, tender and impressionable squash. Oh, they thought the carrots were marvelous. And the carrots were glad to be admired, but they noticed that the rabbits never looked at them. They became more flamboyant. They became louder. They twirled the green feathers on their hats until the beets turned pale with envy. But still, the rabbits did not look. The rabbits had been taught that staring was rude and bragging was poor manners. The, finally, the carrots could not stand it any longer. They ran to the hedge and they called over the hedge, I say, I say you there with the silly ears. Oh, do you mean us, said the friendly rabbits? Yes, said the carrots, delighted to be noticed. We want to know. Why do you have such silly ears? We do not think our ears are silly. They are the only ears we have. Besides, said the oldest rabbit, with our ears we can listen to our friend the grass. Oh, you listen to the grass, you should listen to us, said the carrots. And the rabbits simply turned and went away back into the field. They were very loyal and the carrots began to make fun of them. Oh, look at me, I have silly ears. I'm gonna listen to your grass. Oh, the other vegetables laughed and they applauded and they thought it was so funny. The carrots could do it again the next day. They called over the hedge, hey, hey, you there with the silly eyes. Do you mean us, said the rabbits? Yes, said the carrots. We want to know, why do you have such silly eyes? We do not think our eyes are silly. They are the only eyes we have. And besides, said one of the rabbits, with our eyes, we can see what's behind our backs without turning our heads. And all of the rabbits turned their backs on the carrots and did not turn their heads. But one called back, we can still see you. Oh, oh, the carrots couldn't stand it. Oh, look at me, look at me with my silly eyes. I can see what you're doing back there. Oh, what are you doing back there? Oh, they had so much fun. And the other vegetables encouraged them and egged them on and laughed. and. Well, they could hardly wait for the next day. When the rabbits came out, the carrots were ready. They ran to the hedge. I say, you, you with the silly tails. Do you mean us, said the rabbits? Yes, said the carrots. Yes, we want to know why you have those silly tails. Hmm. We do not think our tails are silly. They are the only tails we have. And a little rabbit said, besides, if one of us puts up his tail and runs, we all know to run. And with that, they all put up their tails and they all ran away. And when the carrots saw those little rabbit tails bobbing over the field, oh, they fell down laughing. They couldn't stand it. And then, of course, oh, then, did they have fun? Oh, hey, I'm putting my tail up. Oh. Well, you know, when you got a good thing going, you're not going to stop. So the next day, 
when the rabbits came out, the carrots were lined up at the hedge. They were, couldn't wait. They were hooting. They were yelling. They were going, hey, I say, you, you with the silly teeth. Do you mean us? said the carrots as they marched to the hedge. Yes, said the carrots. I mean, the rabbits marched to the hedge. <laughs> yes, said the carrots. Ah, they said, we want to know why you have those silly teeth. We do not think our teeth are silly. They are the only teeth we have. And the toughest rabbit said, Besides, with our teeth, we can chew through anything. Oh, anything, said the carrots. Can you chew through trees? Can you chew through rocks? No, but we can chew through you. You knew that was coming. <laughs> and with that, the rabbits thundered under the hedge and fell upon the carrots. The carnage was terrible. The carrots were rude and, and fearless, but they were no match for the sharp teeth of the rabbits. And before long, there was not a carrot left alive. And then the rabbits fell upon the rest of the vegetables around watching. And by nightfall, there were no vegetables left in the garden. And from that time to this, no vegetable has been safe in the presence of a hostile rabbit. <laughs> mm, but they still come out at night and in the morning to trim the grass and to listen to the grass roots talking down below. And sometimes people consult those grass roots, but they never talk to, to vegetables. And vegetables never say a word. They do not dare. But I did hear from a passing cyclist about a pumpkin patch out in Unionville. And she said that on fine autumn evenings, you could hear the pumpkins singing, Indiana, oh, Indiana. <laughs> but you know, that cyclist, unlike me, she might not have been telling the truth. such violence tonight. Thank you. Clean mic. I look out here and I see a lot of my friends. I'm glad to be here. Tonight I want to tell you about William Howard Taft, but before I do, I want to tell you about me. My name is Richard Crow. I've been in uh, Bloomington for a little over a year. I came uh, just like Lincoln across the Ohio River. I love it here, I'm glad I'm here. But my home is Hazard, Kentucky. And if you've been following the news, you know that Hazard has been flooded out. The death toll right now is 16 with four from one family killed. And there's a long history between Hazard and Fort Wayne, Indiana. Starting in 1957, the worldwide flood, Fort Wayne sent uh, semi-full, semi-truck full uh, food and clothing in their need when Fort Wayne flooded, Hazard returned the favor, and that's been going on since 1957. So uh, the people in Hazard need your help. It's the worst flood they've ever had. Lots of deaths, and if you have any uh, charity in your heart and you have a cash in your billfold, help them out, will you? Now, as far as William Howard Taft, I'm going to dedicate this to the man sitting there in front of me, David. Stand up there. This is David McRae, the local attorney. Many of you know him. The whole row is full of my friends there, so I'm tickled to death. But David's mother, Dorothy, was a sworn to God, William Howard Taft Republican. And she never let you forget it. So this is dedicated to Dorothy. Thank you for coming, Thank David. <laughs> Who was William Howard Taft? Why should we remember him? Wasn't he just another one of those lousy Ohio presidents? 
Ohio had seven or eight presidents, none of them dignified in any way. None of them named Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson. They had names that uh, you don't hardly remember. And the least one is probably Howard Taft. What in the world, why would I talk about him? I'm gonna give you three reasons to remember William Howard Taft when you leave this place tonight. You know, uh, he was born in Cincinnati, just down the river, and uh, he, he, he and his father both graduated from Yale. They were both attorneys. They were both secretaries of war. They were both uh, diplomats for the United States. And uh, the, 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 you gotta say that in terms of a silver spoon, William Howard Taft had the silver spoon, so it's the same as the Roosevelt's. So the path was greased for him to have a successful career. He graduated from law school at 21, at graduated from uh, Yale, early, Yale at 21, then graduated from law school, practiced, uh, became a judge before he was 30, and uh, also became uh, the, the uh, Chancellor General, of the Solicitor General of the United States, and uh, in the Sixth District Court out of Cincinnati was a federal judge. So he did all that at a very young age, and then he was tapped on the shoulder and asked to go to the Philippines, of all places. And the Philippines had just become part of the uh, United States, and they had no leadership, they had no connections, so he was the first civilian governor of the Philippines. Probably the best job he ever did in his life. He loved it, his wife hated it. She wanted to go back to Washington. She had said before they got married that she would only marry a man who could become president of the United States because she wanted to live in Washington and go to parties and have a lot of importance. So Teddy Roosevelt asked Taft to come back to the United States to be a Secretary of War just as his father had been earlier. His wife was happy, Roosevelt was happy, Taft was following rules. They got back and Teddy Roosevelt was an active president. He served two terms. He opened up the environment. He opened up the antitrust laws. He did a lot of things that we remember him for besides being a rough rider and fighting the war in Cuba. And at the end of the two terms, he had to make a decision. Should I be president again or not? He decided that he did not want to be president again, but he wanted to keep his fingers in. He wanted to control what was going on. So he asked his buddy, his good friend, his equal, his peer, William Howard Taft to run for president. Taft did not like the idea, but his wife did. So between Teddy Roosevelt and his wife, he was encouraged. And the deal was this, I'll run for president, but I'm not going out there and campaigning. So Roosevelt told him to sit on the porch, rock in his chair, he would crisscross across the country, get enough votes to get him elected, and he would become the 27th president. And that's the way it worked out. So here we have a man from Cincinnati, Ohio, goes into the president's office. I've heard all this talk about food tonight from all these storytellers. And, and Taft goes in at 242 pounds, and he comes out of presidency at 340 pounds. My goodness, you've seen these pictures of three workers in a bathtub installing a bigger bathtub in the White House. They, Taft never got stuck in there. There's a story going around that he did. He didn't, but the three workers did get in there. They did put in a larger tub because when you go from 242 to 340, the water's gotta go somewhere. <laughs> now, he's at 340, he leaves the presidency. But how does he leave the presidency? Did he just quit? Did he just walk away? No. He had a beef with Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt believed that the Constitution said, if it's not forbidden, then you can do it. Taft read the same Constitution, and his Constitution said, if it's not specifically allowed, you can't do it. So these two views of the Constitution would come into conflict. All the progress that Roosevelt th thought he made, he thought that Taft came behind him and erased it. So at the end of four years, Roosevelt was peeved at his partner, his friend, and he asked, Roosevelt, he asked Taft to step down, let him come back as president. 
Well, Taft didn't like being president, but he didn't want to be dishumbled that way. And so he said no. So this sets up the 1912 election, one of the most famous in history. Roosevelt can't run as a Republican, so he runs on the Bull Moose Party. Taft runs as the Republican. Together, they get 50% of the vote. Woodrow Wilson comes out of Princeton University as his president. He's the Democratic nominee. He gets 48% and he becomes president. So Taft is happy that he no longer has to be president. His wife is sad and Roosevelt's kind of upset and all that, but what is Taft going to do? The dean of the law school at Yale said, why don't you come here? We'll offer you a chair in law. Taft, always aware of the cartoons, his weight and so forth, said, well, I can't come for the chair, but I'll come for a sofa. <laughs> so he goes to Yale, he's in the law school, and lo and behold, the next thing that happens is he's asked to be Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. This is the job he always wanted. This is the job that he wanted to be all his life. He turned down being a justice several times and he set up things to make sure that certain people didn't get to be chief justice because they would be at the age that he would not be able to get the job. So he set it up so he got the job. He becomes Supreme Court Justice. Now, he's known for three things. I'm gonna tell you those three things. One is as chief justice, he uh, streamlined the system. He got rid of all the court cases that didn't have a basis based on the Constitution. So the Supreme Court got a lower load of work. The second thing was that he didn't want five to four decisions. He didn't want weak decisions. So he would arbitrate between the justices. And he would go for the nine to oh, eight to one votes so that the laws would be stronger. And the third thing he did was when he got there, they didn't have a building. Today you look and you see those beautiful eight columns whenever there's a story about the Supreme Court. He designed that building. He got the money from Congress to pay for it. And when he died at age 72, the people went through the rotunda. On one hand was his casket. On the other hand was this huge model of the Supreme Court building yet to be built. So number one, he's one of the best chief justices we ever had. He's the only president that also served as a chief justice. Number two you ought to know about is his interest in baseball. He loved baseball. He's very active. For a big man, he was very active. He, he walked to work four miles every day. He exercised for an hour a day. He loved baseball and loved golf. So he is the first president to throw out the opening day game ball at a major league game. Second thing was, during another game in the seventh inning, he was tired, so he took off his jacket, stood up, and rushed out like this, and everybody in the stadium the Washington Senator Stadium stood up, did the same thing, and so you created the seventh inning stretch. <laughs> the third thing he did for baseball was the best team that ever played baseball, the 1927 Yankees. Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, they won 110 games, but he gave them their manager. His student, his law student in Cincinnati was named Miller Huggins. He played second base for the Cincinnati Reds, went to law school when he had time. One day, Chase asked him, he said, sir, you don't seem to have a real interest in the law. You don't seem to have a drive. You don't seem to have a goal in mind. What are you gonna do with your life? And Miller Huggins said, well, I've been thinking about that. He said, I'm almost ready to graduate, but I don't know whether I'll be a good lawyer or not. I probably don't know, probably won't be. So his professor, Taft, says, son, you finish this, this program, you pass the bar, then you go back to baseball. You'll make more money at baseball than you will at law because you love it more. And so Miller Huggins is in the Hall of Fame as the baseball manager of the 1927 Yankees, thanks to his professor. And the third thing we have to talk about is that weight. My goodness, he could eat. His usual breakfast would be a dozen eggs and a pound of bacon. Then he'd go from there. One time he was on a train going across the country. He was two miles from uh, Harrisonburg, Pennsylvania, 10 o'clock at night, and he got hungry. So he called the porter in and he said, Porter, have them open the dining car. And the porter said, 
sir, we don't have a dining car. And he said, I'm the president of the United States. If I can't have a dining car, nobody can have a dining car. How could this happen? Then he realized that his wife and his doctor had plotted against him and taken the food away from him, no dining car. So he told them to wire ahead to Harrisonburg, two hours ahead, have a dining car ready to attach to this train and get out of town. So from midnight to the rest of the day, he ate all he wanted to. <laughs> he loved to eat. So he graduated from high school at 242. At the end of his presidency, he weighed 340. He went back down to 242. He went back up to 340. Then he went back down to 242. He died at 242. Now the way I relate to him is this. I also went on the same diet and I also lost 100 pounds. So when I think about how big he was and how hard it was to get around, I think, oh my gosh, I've walked in his steps. And these pants might come down. <laughs> so he was a big man, but he was, he was active, and he's healthy, and he lived a long life. He was active in baseball, and he did streamline the Supreme Court. So William Howard Taft, of all the lousy Ohio presidents, he's probably the best. Thank you. You'll all be relieved to know that I'm keeping my clothes on. <laughs> and this is attached. <clears throat> Let's all take a deep breath. Ready? In through the nose, out through the mouth. The story that I have to tell you tonight is a small story, but it will require some thought, especially when the story is over. Now one day a man was walking through the forest. It was a beautiful day, much like today has been, when he heard some breaking sticks behind him. When he looked over his shoulder, he saw that he was being tracked by a tiger. And the tiger, seeing the man notice him, started going faster and faster. And the man, he began to run. And he ran, and he ran. And the tiger got closer and closer and closer until the man came to a cliff. The tiger was almost upon him when the man decided the only thing he could do was to jump. And he did. He vaulted over the cliff and caught on to a vine that was growing from a crevice And there he swung next to the cliff. When he looked up, he saw the tiger looking down at him. Oh, how far would be the fall to And below him he saw another tiger, a tiger pacing back and forth at the base of the cliff. How long could he hold on to this vine? It wasn't too much longer. 
when a couple of mice came out of that crevice and they started to gnaw upon that vine, to go through that vine that now got thinner and thinner. And above, he saw a tiger. Below, he saw a tiger, their eyes upon him, and the mice continued to gnaw through that vine. When the man saw just over here, a strawberry, a beautiful red strawberry, it shone and he reached over and he took the strawberry and he ate it. And it was delicious. And that is the Zen Buddha story of the man and the tiger. The ending is up to you. everyone. I'm Christina Jones, and I'm so glad to be here and to see you all here tonight on this lovely summer evening. Uh, I believe I'm your last teller, so, but, oh, we got last but one. We saved the best for last. Okay. So my story is uh, The Pumpkin Child, and it comes from Persia. So a long time ago, across an ocean of time, At the, end, at the edge of a village, there lived a man and a woman who had love, they had a home, they had everything, everything, everything. But can you guess? They didn't have a child. And so every evening, they would look at each other in their, in their eyes and they would wish and they would pray for a child every night, every night. And they would get so close every night, every night. And finally, the man said, you know, I wouldn't care if this child was a pumpkin. I just want the gift of a child. And so they held on. And then the next day, the woman noticed that her morning tea didn't appeal to her anymore. And she started having strange cravings and she knew, she knew. And so she carried that baby and she was so proud and so happy because they loved each other so much. And do you know, when the baby came into this world, she was beautiful. She had smooth brown skin like it was kissed by the sun. She had blue eyes that shone like sapphires, and her lips were pink like pomegranate seeds. This child was beautiful. And the father was so proud because they had waited so long. And their friends were blessed with so many children, and they were always throwing it in their face. And so finally, he had a child to show them. And so he would lift the child on his shoulder and, and prance around the village and say, look at my child, look at her eyes, they sparkle. They sparkle like sapphires. Her lips are like pomegranate seeds. And then he'd peek in the blanket of another child and say, hmm. <laughs> and so it was, day after day. They were so enamored with this child that every morning they would creep in and look in her bassinet and they would sing her awake. And at night, they would sing her to sleep. 
And so it was. And so they were happy. Until one morning, they went in, and they started to sing. And they lifted her blanket. And there, instead of a child, was a small, hard, green pumpkin. All the blood rushed out of the father's face. He looked in horror. He felt it was his fault. He couldn't bear it. And he ran. He ran and ran and ran. But the mother stayed. And she touched the pumpkin. And somehow she knew. And she stroked it. And she picked it up and she held it. And that's what she did for months and years. She carried the pumpkin. And she sang to it. She spoke to it. And as she did that, the pumpkin grew and grew and became less green and more orange until she couldn't carry it anymore. It was huge. And so she had to teach it how to roll. And so she put it on the floor and she kind of pushed it. And that pumpkin child knew just what to do and it rolled right out the door and rolled up to some children that were just the pumpkin child's age. And they laughed. At first they were horrified, but then they remembered and they scoffed at her and they made all kinds of fun. But the pumpkin child just rolled away and rolled into the village, rolled back, rolled around the house. And her mother sang and her mother slept until it became time for the pumpkin child to go to school. And so she had a word with the schoolmistress. And on that morning, she kissed her pumpkin child and she said, remember who you are. And with that, she set her down the road. And the pumpkin child rolled all the way into the village, bumped up the steps to the school, knocked on the door, and the door opened, and the teacher rolled her eyes, and the pumpkin child rolled right into school. And there she learned, alongside all the other ladies in the village. Now, every day during school, those ladies in that school would go out into the courtyard, and it was right in the center of the building. It was hidden, a hidden courtyard. And they would have a lunch. And so the pumpkin child went too. Now, what the ladies didn't know was there was a wealthy merchant's son that lived on the other edge of the garden wall. And so he would make a habit of spying on the ladies as they lunched. And it just so happened that one day he saw a pumpkin roll out with the other ladies. And it rolled under a bush. And he saw, and yes, a beautiful woman with brown, sun-kissed skin and eyes like sapphires and lips like pomegranate seeds. This was the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen in his life. And she scaled up the side of the wall. No one noticed. And she ate the grapes that were on the vine. She scaled back down and disappeared. And then the next thing she saw was a pumpkin rolling out from under the bushes. Well, this went on day after day. He wasn't crazy. He knew his eyes were good. He put two and two together. So the next time they had lunch, here's the pumpkin child rolling under the bush, scaling up the wall. The merchant's son was ready. He was on the other side. And just as that woman grabbed the grapes, he grabbed her wrist. And her eyes flew open. And they shone like sapphires. And she said, oh! and she snatched her hand away. But as she did so, she left a ring in his hand. The pumpkin child rolled away. And the merchant's son went in to speak to his mother. 
And he said, Mother, I know who I'm going to marry. At last, at last, I'm going to have a grandchild. Who is it? Who is it? Who's the lucky, who's the lucky lady? And he said, I don't know her name. I don't know anything about her, really, other than this is her ring. And so what I need you to do is go from door to door to see who fits this ring. Well, it was a small village, and word spread fast. And so all of the eligible girls were either starving themselves to shrink up their, their fingers or eating extra butter to plumpen up, whatever they could do to win the heart of this merchant's son. And so the mother sent her faithful servant, Nana, door to door to door. And as you can probably guess, none fit just right until she got to the door of the pumpkin child. And so she knocked on the door and said, are there any eligible maidens here? You've probably heard by now we're sizing this ring. And the mother said, stop, stop with your torturing. You know that I have a pumpkin child. She has no hands. She has no ring. And Nana thought, hmm, I have got to see this. She said, well, let me see. And so the mother said, come on. And in rolled this beautiful pumpkin, bum, 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 right up to Nana. And wouldn't you know, right out of the stock came this beautiful, smooth, sun-kissed arm, snatched the ring, put it on, and it fit perfectly, and went right back in. Well, Nana had a lot of explaining to do when she got home, <laughs> but she did her best. And the merchant's son was there, and he smiled and nodded and said, yes, I'm going to make, do I'm make, gonna make good on that promise. And so they were wed. And it was a beautiful wedding. And the pumpkin child had the most beautiful veil, and it trailed for miles. And everyone ate and sang and tried to pretend that the, the merchant's son wasn't marrying a pumpkin, but he was, in fact, marrying a large pumpkin. And he kissed that pumpkin, and he went to the remote home that his father bought just for the two of them, well out of sight, <laughs> well out of sight. And so it was, the merchant's son and the pumpkin child lived happily for many weeks and many months <laughs> until one morning, the merchant's son started to sing and he rolled over and there, instead of a pumpkin, was a beautiful woman brown sun-kissed skin and eyes like sapphires and lips like pomegranates. And he said, why now? And she said, because you loved me, even though I was a pumpkin. And that's the story of the pumpkin child. Farmer's Market. Hi, my name is Laura Clavio, and my story today is Man and the Willow. Kovac stole the throne of Ireland. He came in unannounced one day, and he killed the king, and he killed the king's son, and he he took the grandchild, a child named Man, and he tortured him. He made his life so difficult, and he did so many vile things to that child that by the time the child was five years old, he no longer spoke. Well, some people helped him out, and he got away, and he was taken to France, which was the country of his grandmother. And there he lived his early childhood. And he always wore a long floppy hat. And nobody really knew why, they just knew that was part of him and they knew that he didn't speak. So they thought maybe that's a security thing for him. Well, the child grew into a fine young man 
except that he was silent. He didn't speak at all. When he had been a child and living in France, he remembered the time that he had played with the king's son in Ireland, whose, I'm sorry, the king's daughter in Ireland, whose name was Marina. And she carried a torch for him all of those years. And when she grew to young womanhood, she called the minstrel from the court and she asked, said, I have a poem, a love poem I want you to set to music. And then I want you to go to France and take this to the child that I knew, Man. And so the minstrel took the poem and he wrote beautiful music for it. And he traveled all the way to France and he met the child who was now a fine young man and he played the music for him. And Man was so touched by the music and by the sentiments in the poem that he burst it out and said, that is the most wonderful poem I've ever heard. I can feel the love in it. And at that point, he regained his voice. Well, at that time, the uh, king of France decided it was time to tell him who he really was. And so they told him that he was the true king of Ireland. And they gave him an army and he set off and he went back to Ireland and unannounced he went into the court of Kovac and he slew him and he took back the throne of Ireland and everyone wondered who is this person that's come and claimed the throne and the druid who was still an advisor to the king asked some of the soldiers who, who is this, this man that comes and they said we we don't know anything about him except that we call him Man the Mariner, and he's a mighty warrior. The Druid thought back, and he decided he would go and ask this new king a question. He said, have you always spoken the way you speak now? And Man said, well, I recall when I was younger, I had no speech at all. And at that point, the Druid knew who he was. And of course, the first thing that Mon did was seek out Marina, the beautiful young girl that he had played with, and he married her. And they lived happily ever after for about 10 years. And then, well, you know, that floppy hat, he still wore all the time. and. Uh, every once in a while, a man has to get a haircut, right? Only whenever somebody cut Mon's hair, they had to be killed. And one day, uh, the, the, the barber, whoever the barber would be, was always chosen by lottery. And so uh, one t at, at the, the next lottery, uh, uh, the son of a very poor woman was chosen to be the barber. And, she went to the king and she begged and begged for his life. He was her only son and he could keep a secret. She promised he would never tell. Mon's heart softened. He said, very well, if he can really keep a secret, I won't have him put to death. But if he ever says a word about what he sees, that will be the end of him. She promised most sincerely and the man came to cut Mon's hair and Mon took off his hat. Well, you may have guessed by this time there was maybe something a little strange going on and when Mon took off his hat to get his hair cut, he revealed his long donkey-like ears. They were long, they were furry and uh, well, if anybody knew about it, you know, they would, they would certainly think that he was not the man that they thought he was. Well, everything went fine, and the young man went home, and well, you know how secrets are. First they eat at you a little bit, and then they begin to 
kind of grate on you and and before long it was making him nervous and he just wasn't he just couldn't stand it anymore and finally he told his mother I'm getting sick I I can't keep this in any longer I don't know what to do I can't tell anybody and it's just making me sick so his mother called the druid and the druid came over and he said, well, there's a simple solution to this. I want you to go out into the forest and when you come to a crossroad, turn right and the first tree that you see, tell your secret to that tree and then you'll feel much better. So that's just what the man did. He went out into the forest and when he came to the crossroad, he turned right and the first tree he came to was a great big old really ancient willow tree and he put his arms around the willow tree and he said the king has donkey ears the king has donkey ears well the more he said it the more he embraced that tree the better he felt and before long he felt totally healed and he went home and everything was great for another year or two well, you know, minstrels, they play on their harps all the time. And it was finally became time for the minstrel to get a new instrument. And so he went out into the forest and he was looking for a strong tree to take some wood from to create a new instrument. And he came across that same willow tree. And he found a nice big branch that would make a beautiful harp. And he took that branch home and he formed it into a harp and he strung it with gold strings. And it was a beautiful instrument and they were going to have a big celebration for the first playing of the new instrument. And so all the court was gathered and the king and the queen were there and everyone was ready to hear the beautiful music from that harp. And the minstrel began to stroke the harp. But instead of music coming out of it, it began to sing. The king has donkey ears. The king has donkey ears. The whole court heard it all at once. Well, what could the king do? He was standing there up in front of everyone. First he was kind of unsure of himself, but then he took off his long floppy hat and his donkey ears flowed down. And at first there was a snicker, then a chuckle, then a chortle, and pretty soon everybody was laughing at the top of their lungs and having a great laugh at the king. And he just stood there and took it and then finally the, the laughing began to change. It began to change to clapping. And pretty soon everybody was clapping their hands. And they were all so proud of this king who stood before them with his strange body. And he wasn't ashamed of himself and they all began to clap and cheer their brave king who was able to take his disability and turn it into something of strength. And from that time forward, everyone knew his secret, and they lived forever, happily ever after. Thank you. That's our last story of the evening. I'd like to thank the Monroe County Public Library for hosting us tonight and the members of the Guild for putting together, together such great stories. We hope you had a good time, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.